welcome back to No Water River and the history of American children's poets of the 20th century with Lee Bennett Hopkins. Hi, Lee. Great to have you back again. Hi, Renee. Um, this is our fourth episode, and so we'll be talking about the 1950s. Again, this series is a decade, decade by decade overview of American children's poets. In the 1950s, we have quite a few. Um, so let me just give you a rundown on those. We have Ogden Nash, David McCord, William J. Smith, Gwendolyn Brooks, Carla Cuskin, uh, Beatrice Schenck de Renier, Myra Cohn Livingston, John Chardy, Marianne Hoberman, and Robert Frost. So uh, a lot of great writers in here. Um, so since we do have quite a few, I'm going to hand this right over to you, Lee, to get us started. Well, like the past episodes that we did, Renee, a lot of these authors are crossover authors mm -hmm. who wrote a lot of adult work, whose work finally uh, dribbled down into children's book collections. Uh, so I'll talk about that. But we'll start with 1950 uh, with Frederick Ogden Nash, uh, who was born in uh, 19... O2 in Rye, New York, uh, who had a fascinating career. Uh, in addition to writing over 20 collections of poetry for both adults and children, he wrote the lyrics to the stage play, One Touch of Venus, which featured the very popular song, Speak Low, and also established Mary Martin as a Broadway star. So again, these lives are so creatively interconnected with everything. Uh, Nash once stated, uh, he said, I think in terms of rhyme, and I have since I was six years old. Uh, although published as early as 1933, a final edition of, of his books, Parents Keep Out, uh, elderly Verses for Younger Leave Readers appeared in 51. In 1980, and it took a long time before that came out, a uh, Custard and Company was published, which was the collection of 74 poems selected and illustrated by Quinton Blake. Uh, Nash died in 1971 at the age of 68. Uh, in 2002, uh, again noting his creativity, a United States 37 cent postage stamp was issued on the 100th anniversary of his death. A lot of his poems were simply silly. I love reading this with children. It's called The Pizza. Look at Itsy Bitsy Mitsy. See her figure, slim and ritzy. She eats a pizza, greedy Mitzi. She no longer itsy bitsy. <laughs> it's that wonderful wordplay uh, that he used uh, in such a humorous way, uh, which I find fascinating. Uh, moving on to 52, 1952. Uh, we did have David McCord, word master at best, uh, who published his first book, uh, Far and Few, Rhymes of the Never Was and Always Is in 1952. Uh, and in 77, David received the first NCT award for excellence in poetry for children. And we uh, just interject, since we do have five NCTE winners on the 1950s list, um, right. as we did with the last episode, I'll put all those links to those posts in right. this blog post, so uh, people can go off and um, get to know those poets as well, because yeah. we, we covered them in depth already. Yes. So. No, I am fortunate to have known David McCord, and uh, listening to him read his work was always a very privileged treat. And as you said, there'll be a link to the tape we did on the Spotlight series. Uh, moving on to 
to William J. Smith, uh, who was born in Winfield, Louisiana in 1918. He also wrote poetry for adults and children. Uh, his first book of adult poems was titled Poems and appeared in 1947. This collection, Laughing Time, um, collected nonsense, uh, came out in 1953, featuring a complete alphabet from alpaca to zebu, clarios, limericks, and a host of couplets such as my body. Wherever I go, it also goes. And when it's dressed, I'm wearing clothes. <laughs> uh, from 1968 to 1970, uh, Smith was the 19th US Poet Laureate. Uh, he died in 2015 at the age of 97. 1956, an important year, Gwendolyn Brooks, who was all, already established as a major poet, uh, published Bronxville Boys and Girls. Uh, six decades later, uh, I find her words are as timely as when she wrote them. I mean, they could have been written for now. Uh, Gwendolyn was born in Topeka, Kansas in 1917. Uh, interested in poetry at a very early age, her first poem appeared in a well-known magazine of its time, American Childhood, when she was merely 13 years old. In 1950, she became the first African American to win the Pulitzer Prize for Annie Allen. Uh, to give a glimpse of the depth of her work, uh, I know you're going to share a very poignant adult poem of hers called The Bean Eaters, which was from her third book, The Bean Eaters and Other Poems, published in 1960. Mm -hmm. So share with us The Bean Eaters. Okay, we will do. Um, and just a side note, I loved Gwendolyn Brooks. Um, for years and years, and she's one of the few poets. I actually went to a, a poetry reading of hers at my undergrad college, and I was just, I just remember being blown away. This was in the mid 80s, and she was just wonderful, and also just a really warm uh, person. Oh, it was marvelous person. Yeah. I knew her quite well. Yeah, it was a great, I, really, I felt really lucky. I mean, uh, it was a small group, and it was, she was just lovely. And, and I, I did have a chance to interview her. Uh -huh. long before she died it was she was an incredible woman again lucky for you lee <laughs> <laughs> once again uh, all right so let's read the bean eaters by gwendolyn brooks they eat beans mostly this old yellow pear dinner is a casual affair plain chipware on a plain and creaking wood tin flatware Two who are mostly good. Two who have lived their day, but keep on putting on their clothes and putting things away and remembering. Remembering with twinklings and twinges as they lean over the beans in their rented back room that is full of beads and receipts and dolls and cloths, tobacco crumbs, vases, and fringes. Poignant. And so her, uh, she lived on the south side of Chicago, a very difficult area, her entire life. Uh, now in contrast with Bronxville Boys and Girls, this is a newer edition that was published uh, with illustrations by Faith Grint Ringgold. Uh, Bronxville, again, I think should be in every classroom in the country. It features 34 poems, each bearing the name of an individual child. Uh, one poem in the book is called Skipper, a poem that I don't know always resonated with me. Uh, as a poor child living in 
uh, what were called railroad flat apartments or the projects. Uh, we couldn't have pets, but we could have a goldfish. And I always felt sorry for those poor little things in those little glass bowls. <laughs> and naturally, they didn't live long. Uh, and I had one that I was quite affectionate with. And it died, of course. And my aunt said, flush it down the toilet, which is what one did with a goldfish. And after I read Skipper, she changed my life. She writes Skipper. I looked in the fish glass, and what did I see? A pale little goldfish looked sadly at me. At the base of the bowl, so still he was lying. Are you dead, little fish? Oh, no, but I'm dying. I gave him fresh water and the best of fish food, but it was too late. I did him no good. I buried him by our old garden tree, our old garden tree who will protect him from me. Stunning. And from then on, Whenever I had a fish, when the fish died, it is carefully buried <laughs> under a garden tree in our house. <laughs> it's amazing how poetry can be so extremely emotional and sensitive. And it really is a poem that changed my life in regarding a fish. It's, it's incredible. Well, it's really, I just, I have never read this book. Um, Oh, I'm going to get it, uh, but that was a really touching poem. I kind of got a little teary myself. Um, she, the whole, no, the idea who will protect him, who will protect it for beautiful. me. Beautiful, yeah. Uh, some of them are sad. Some of them are just wordplay at its best. Uh, quickly, here's one called Cynthia. Cynthia in the snow. It sushes. It hushes the loudness in the road. It flitter twitters and laughs away from me. It laughs a lovely whiteness and whitely whirs away to be some other wear. Still white as milk or shirts. So beautiful it hurts. I mean, rhyme at its very best. Um, a recent, this is a must have collection for any Brooks fan. Uh, it was published in 20, 2017 called Seasons, a Gwendolyn Brooks experience, which is edited by her daughter, Nora Brooke Blakely and Cynthia uh, Walls. Uh, I've been in touch with Nora, Gwendolyn's daughter, uh, and we've had long conversations about Gwendolyn and her work. Uh, when I interviewed Gwendolyn Brooks, Nora wasn't born yet. <laughs> and now, of course, she's a grown woman. Uh, Gwendolyn died in 2003 at the age of 83. Uh, in an interview I did with this legend, she stated something wonderful about writing. She said, writing is a delicious agony. How true. <laughs> writing is a delicious agony. Uh, 1956, Carla Cuska came on the scene uh, with Roar and More. Roar and More. And she received the NCT Poetry Award, and her work also will be found uh, on the link with the NCT mm -hmm. Spotlight series. In 58, Beatrice Schenk de Renier and Myra, Myra Cohn Livingston both entered in 
Livingston, of course, received uh, the um, NCT award. Uh, and for an overlook of her work, of course, we refer you to that episode of the Spotlight series. Uh, Duranier's book of poems, Something Special, uh, begins with what has become her signature poem and also is popular now as when it was written uh, back in the 50s. It's called Keep a Poem in Your Pocket, and you're going to share it. I am, uh, especially, I, mean, I did not know about this poem until you sent it off to me. I said, aha, Ooh. that's where it comes from. Yeah, I'm, I'm not familiar with the, uh, with this author, with this poet. And in fact, you know, the Poetry Friday crowd, of course, um, is big on Poem in Your Pocket Day, which is a day that occurs during National Poetry Month every April. And uh, so I went to look around a little bit to see what that was all about. And it was uh, begun in 2002, in April 2002, by the Office of the Mayor of New York City, which I was not aware of. And then in 2008, it was uh, sort of, let's say, taken over by the Academy of American Poets. And they sort of took it nationwide. And now it's international. Yeah. And, you know, in, in later years, and the, the Canadian uh, League of Canadian Poets picked it up and they spread it through Canada. And then it just kept growing and growing. Um, and so it's a thing now. So all due to her poem. <laughs> all due to this poem, which I was not aware of, uh, this year, 2019, it will be on April 18th. Uh, I actually wrote to them today to verify that because I saw other dates around the blogosphere or the internet and uh, they confirmed April 18th. And so basically on this day, you select a poem that you love, you put it in your pocket, just like the poem says, and you share it with whoever you encounter at the school, bookstore, the, you know, the coffee shop, uh, social media, they have the hashtag uh, pocket poem. So uh, I think it's just, marvelous how this came to be and based on this lovely poem. So I'm going to share this poem. Uh, keep a poem in your pocket. Keep a poem in your pocket and a picture in your head and you'll never feel lonely at night when you're in bed. The little poem will sing to you. The little picture bring to you a dozen dreams to dance to you at night when you're in bed. So keep a picture in your pocket and a poem in your head, and you'll never feel lonely at night when you're in bed. Lovely. And it's really again, something special has a lot of wonderful poems. Uh, it's a book that I highly recommend. Uh, I worked with Beatrice Shag Derenye for more than seven years. Uh, when I was, uh, she was the founding editor of Lucky Book Club at Scholastic, uh, a job she had held for over 20 years. And Beatrice and I uh, worked very closely all the time I was at Scholastic. Uh, she was born in Lafayette, Indiana, in, uh, and her first book for children, The Giant Story, a picture book, was illustrated by Marie Sendak. And in 1953, and another title, May I Bring a Friend, brought the Caldecott Medal uh, to Bainey Montresor. So it, again, the multi-talents of this woman uh, are incredible. Author of over 50 books, she also published books under a pseudonym that many people pick up and probably never knew, the pseudonym Tamara Kitt. Tammy and Kit were her cat's names. So she put it together as Tamara Kit. Uh, Beatrice and I remained very, very good friends up to her death in 2000 at the age of 86. She was a very, very special, special woman. Uh, she was, as the book says, something special. Um, moving on to 59, 1959, 
works by both John Chardy and Marianne Haberman, Haberman appeared. Uh, Chiardi, of course, received the 82 NCT award, Haberman in 82, and both poets are featured on the Spotlight series. Lastly, the decade closes with a collection of works by Robert Lee Frost, uh, one of America's most celebrated poets. Uh, born in 1874, uh, Frost published an adult book called A Boy's Will in 1915, an adult book which was first published in England before it came, his work came to America. Uh, we could spend days talking about his poetic genius, but to focus on how his poetry has become a staple in children's literature, uh, we can go back to a book called You Come To, uh, which is 51 of his poems uh, selected for young readers. Uh, this book includes his classics, Stopping by Woods on a Snowy Evening, and a beautiful poem called The Pasture, which you're going to share. Yeah. Uh, thank you for sending this to me. It's just beautiful. It's beautiful. Yeah. The Pasture. I'm going out to clean the pasture spring. I'll only stop to rake the leaves away and wait to watch the water clear, I may. I shan't be gone long. You come too. I'm going out to fetch the little calf that's standing by the mother. It's so young. It totters when she licks it with her tongue. I shan't be gone long. You come too. Wouldn't you love to come too? <laughs> I just love this invitation to the reader, to the, it's just, absolutely charming just and so just beautifully accessible and but not simple it's just you know and it took all all that while for a collection of his children's poems uh to come about few know uh that this book was a labor of love that was created by uh another one of my beloved best friends, Nancy Larrick, uh, who was a renowned educator and advocate of poetry for children. She received no credit for the publication, but it was she who got Holt to bring this book about. Amazing. Uh, Robert Frost died, of course, in 1963 at the age of 89. Well, this winds up the 50s. Uh, quite a decade, quite a roster of talents, as you mentioned before. And the 60s, we're going to see a host of a lot more exciting voices. So I look forward to that uh, and getting the next one done the decade of the 1960s. And uh, so do I. And um, we'll have this up as soon as we can. And once again, Lee, thank you so much for the research that you're putting into the series. And uh, I know that I really enjoy hearing the backstories of some of these poets that I you know, didn't know about. Yeah, it really is. And it's wonderful to put that uh, human, <laughs> the humanity behind uh, you know, the work that we're reading and, and, and looking at. So all of these wonderful poets will be in the blog post below this video. Uh, with a representative poem and maybe a couple of little extra ones that I came across that I just fell in love with as well that I want to share with you. So and although we're just giving a sampling of yes of these course. works. We we hope that your people will go out and extend buy see the books, borrow them from the library, buy them, and share them with children. My it's library a, has definitely already increased uh, through doing this series with you. So yeah, it's <laughs> a cash. Wonderful literature. Yeah. Yep. 
Uh, Thank you, and it's, great, yeah, it's great to see the history of, of, of poetry growing on my, my own bookshelves, honestly. You know, I have a lot of con more contemporary children's poets, but I don't have, uh, you know, some of these that we're, we're looking at now. Like, I definitely don't have a Gwendolyn Brooks uh, children's collection, and that's just, uh, you know, that's got to happen. Um, so it's just been wonderful to learn along with, I hope everybody who's watching as well. So thank you again, Lee, and we'll see you back here for the 1960s. <clears throat> okay. <laughs> okay. And thank you once again for joining us. We'll see you with the next episode. Bye-bye. Looking forward as always. Me too. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.